The uh, title of the sermon today is Thy Kingdom Come, Thy Will Be Done. And the scripture reading uh, will be from Revelation 2, 8 to 11 by Mr. Ken Hayward. And the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. These are the words of Jesus to seven churches in Asia Minor. Thank you, Jesus, for loving, for teaching, for convincing, and for correcting of error, and for the instruction in right doing, so that your people may be competent and equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. You know, as I said before, today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And uh, I'll be commenting on the scripture uh, that you've just read today towards the end of the sermon. But in this troubled world, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ takes even more significance. And the good news of Jesus Christ has many facets. And the central part of this good news is that Jesus has redeemed humanity from the dark hole of sin and death in his incarnation as one of us. And, and by his life honored, by his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, and the good news that he has sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we have hope for a life of immortality, a life where, there will, where we will no longer die. And I realize, Father, as we think of what God is telling us in these, verse, in these verses in his plan of salvation, that when we look at this world, there's so much going on that is not of God, that sometimes we may think that evil is winning, but evil is not winning. Evil is defeated, and one day in God's time will completely come to an end. And that's the, the, all, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And, and as we, as his church, we are very privileged, and it's all by the grace of God, because everyone is a son of God and a daughter of God by creation. But in his church, we are recipients of a brand new identity in Jesus Christ. We are adopted sons and daughters by grace. And and this is something new that God has made in his people and that we have this new life, this new identity that God has created in us by the very presence of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our hearts, by the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus came to earth, he came as an ordinary man. Isaiah 53 tells us that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by man. He was a man of sorrows and equated with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and despised and we esteemed him not. And it tells us who Jesus was when he came to the earth. This is a prophecy. And Jesus was just an ordinary man. He did not attract particular attention by his physical beauty or anything. He was an ordinary Jew um, who, from the onset of his coming, 
the, the evil one tried to destroy them. And when Jesus came to the earth, all the forces of evil rose against him in an effort to destroy him. And men being in darkness, because they were receptive to the God of this world, in their blindness and influenced by demonic forces, they also turned against Jesus. And at the time, they did not recognize who Jesus was. And even when we look at the apostles, their faith was not firm. Because after his death, they all forgot what Jesus had said, and they all went back to their previous occupations. And it was not until they met the resurrected Jesus personally and received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that they became very strong in their faith and very strong in their union with Jesus Christ. And they were sent people by God to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. So it's not surprising that people of this world, you know, who did not recognize Jesus, would not recognize his church because his church is composed of called out ones by God the Father and given to Jesus Christ. And this is something that there's a lot to meditate about that. That in his church, not everybody's in his church right now. Uh, we have been called by grace. And God the Father has given us to Jesus Christ. So we are a gift, if you will, of the Father to Jesus Christ. And in fact, the whole humanity is, but most of the humanity does not know it. And Jesus is a gift to us. He's the Father's gift to us. And so Jesus was born when he, he was born in a low part of town, if you will, in, in Galilee. And he continues his work on, on earth and he's calling ordinary men and women who are described in the Bible in the following way. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 29, who we are as God's people from a physical point of view. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful and not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things there are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And so the church of Jesus Christ does not attract attention by its prestige in this world, or it doesn't attract attention by its power, in fact. God called weak people, he said. And so we are the opposite of what the world describes as success in many ways. But yet, and we realize that we are called, we appreciate it, we thank God for it. And we appreciate the fact that our life in Jesus Christ, who came to the earth as a suffering and humble servant, he's called us into the same state. You know, and, and the God of this world, we need to realize, is not able to attack Jesus Christ directly. So what does he do? He turns his attention against God's people. And because we live in a different kingdom, Disciples of Jesus Christ who put their faith and trust in him are not recognized. We are not recognized as God's people. And in fact, in the world, it just appears as foolishness. And we should not be surprised at that because the world did not recognize Jesus either. And the reason the world does not know us, the church, is that they do not know Jesus Christ. And so, I'd just like to read the, the following 
court because one should not be surprised that the church in this world is a suffering church. And Alexandria Radcliffe writes in her book, The Claim of Humanity in Christ, Salvation in Jesus Christ, the church that is launched into the situation in history is the suffering servant, the church under the cross. And to all outward appearance, the weak and helpless, the despised and downtrodden church, but it also the church of the victorious king. The shout of a king is in the midst of the church. A new song is, it in, it, is in its mouth. The song of final and complete triumph. A song of indescribable joy and confidence in Jesus Christ. So as we live in this life of ups and downs, the confusion of suffering, we must always remember who God is, because God is a blessing God. And he's, here is how he describes himself. And even if we are a suffering church, in many ways, what, there is a, even if sometimes if we feel sorrow, and, but there is, and it seems a paradox, but there is joy knowing that God is in, very involved in our lives that we have hope of eternal life, that we have been called for a very special mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, and that there is, there is hope for those who do not know God, hope for this, this world to everyone who will come to faith in Jesus Christ. So in that we, in Christ, we, we have this peace that surpasses understanding. So this is how God describes himself. The Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is the God we serve. He's not, didn't come to the earth to, condemn us no he's merciful he's a forgiving god and we have been forgiven at the cross everyone has been forgiven at the cross in christ that is why the apostle paul can say that our sins are not accounted against us because in the finished work of jesus christ sin has been completely demolished and this is encouraging. And we also need to remember and be reminded of that when we see Jesus, we see the heart of God, the Father. The Father and the Son are of the same mind. And sometimes, you know, we may think that, you know, where is the Father? Well, the Father is where Jesus is. Because who sent Jesus to the earth to be incarnate? The father and he that decision was made before anything was made that god has this had this grand design for for human beings and it's, it's especially important to remember that jesus is the absolute sovereign and the invis invis invincible king not only over all the earth but over the whole universe so sometimes you know as human beings our experience with our fathers was not always the greatest for many. But we cannot equate our physical father with the heavenly father because the heavenly father is perfect. Our heavenly father and us who are fathers are not perfect. So we have to raise our eyes to Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ, we see the heart of the Father. And this is important. And uh, it's interesting what Thomas, Ta Thomas F. Torrance writes in his book, The Apocalypse, Sermon on Revelation. He says, the Christian church, even in her tribulation, is the place where the king 
where the king reigns and holds his court. The king who is the first and the last and who has the keys of life and death. Let us never forget the supreme fact. Jesus Christ has come on earth to do a tremendous deed which will reverse history. Jesus reverses history. He is here to break the power of evil and to set the prisoners free. And in his church, we need to remember that we are freed prisoners of the kingdom of darkness of this world. We are free people, free to serve Jesus Christ, free from the bondage of, of sin. Even if we are still tempted and even if we sin occasionally, we need to remember that we are the beloved adopted children of God. And Jesus is here to strip principalities and powers, to nail them to his cross and to triumph over them openly. He is the great stone flung out of heaven that smites the image of human empire so that the iron and brass, the silver and gold are broken in pieces and become like summer shaft, as we read in Daniel. And certainly what happens is that as powerful as the kingdom of this world appear to be with all the atomic and nuclear power and robotics and all of that, you know, Jesus is going to do away with all of that because he's, he's victor and one day it'll be no more. He says, let us make no mistake about it. The cross of Jesus Christ is still in the field. Jesus Christ still holds the sovereign initiative in history. No doubt the fire, the fire rages in the world. But in the heart of the fire, there is one like unto the Son of God. And out of the heart of it comes the shout of joy of a king who tells us, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. And for that reason, we can be of good cheer. So we do not look, when we see the problems in this world and how overwhelming they seem to be, this is not the end of the story. Because Jesus has overcome the world for all of us. And we are part of that story. He's come to make everything new. So the, the scripture we, we, we read at the beginning of the sermon certainly describes a suffering church living in difficult circumstances. And Thomas Torrance captures that in his book when he says, tribulation arises inevitably from the fact that the church is not of the world and yet is in the world. The church is a foreign body in the midst of the world. The church is born from above and committed in absolute allegiance to Jesus Christ. That is to say, an allegiance outside the world, a foreign allegiance. Because the church is from above, she is a radically disturbing fact in the world. So our allegiance is not in this world. Our allegiance is to Jesus Christ, the King, our Lord, Savior. And talking about the church, he says, she is a troublesome element which creates tension among the nations and ferment in the course of history. Just as Jesus Christ in the midst of a sinful world inevitably, inevitably became the storm center for human sin and its guilty reaction ending on the cross, so the Christian church, as far as she remains faithful and true to Jesus Christ, inevitably creates trouble and ferment and brings upon herself the violent reaction of evil. The church cannot be a true church without causing trouble. She is, as Jesus said, like a fireball cast upon the earth. And isn't that so true? Because what happens is that as we are the body of Christ, and as we live, in Christ, united to him and as his light shine in us, evil 
And we know that the enemy is not human beings. The enemy is principalities and demonic forces as we read in Ephesians. And they cannot get at Jesus Christ. So they're going to, to pressure the church to give in. And, and they, they use all kinds of, of reason. And unfortunately, men who are caught in the uh, kingdom of darkness are receptive to, to, these, to, to the influences of these demonic forces. And I know when I say that, it's, it's quite, can be quite insulting to, to some, but you know, that's the word of God. That's what the word of God says. And, but the good news is that the kingdom of darkness will, will not always be. One day it'll come to an end as God calls people to himself. As God calls people to Jesus Christ. And as people place their faith in him, they will be, they will be enlightened. They will see why God, why God created them. Just like we do at this time, although we see it through imperfect eyes, we don't see it perfectly. Still, this happens. And, and so, as we read this, we can, some people, and we can ask, well, why would a loving God allow such suffering for the church? Why would God allow that? Why doesn't God, when he calls us, put an end to the suffering of the church? Well, God allows human freedom. He respected the choice of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, they made a wrong choice. And Adam and Eve represented all of us. Adam represented all of us. And Adam and Eve made the choice to try to be their own gods. They chose to set the standard for their life instead of accepting their dependence on God for their life. So instead of saying, God, our life is from you, we depend on you, they decided, hey, we're going to be our own gods because they were deceived by the devil and, and the serpent, as Genesis described, describes it. And they decided to say, well, we're going to do it our own way because God, you're hiding things from us. So, you know, rather than trusting you, we're going to trust in ourselves. So evil entered their relationship and their world right from the beginning. Instead of looking to God for their life and guidance, they turned to themselves. And ever since then, trapped in darkness, men and women have tried to acquire salvation by their self-will. What can I do to obtain salvation, to get salvation, to, to have eternal life? Because that's the desire of every human being, that there is life afterwards. Very few people believe that there's nothing afterwards. And when it comes to death, nobody wants to die. But the more humanity tries to save itself, either individually or collectively, the deeper, the deeper we as human beings fall into sin and more misery. And not knowing God, we feel self-justified in trying to find a good life. And Adam and Eve, as we know, faced the horrible consequences of their choice when Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. And the world has been suffering ever since. And God has respected that human choice. Because, you know, he told them, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And God respected that choice. And so Jesus, in his love, because only God made man could redeem us from that mess. Jesus entered this world of rebelliousness and opposition. He accepted to take the consequences of the first Adam the consequences that the first Adam had chosen, chosen upon himself and being perfect in his response to God the Father for all of us, he undid all what the first Adam had done. And he set aside his divinity, his deity, without ever ceasing to be God. 
And he lived a perfect human life, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he became the last Adam. There will not be another Adam. Jesus is it. There will be no other. And Jesus is man as God intended man to be. When we look at Christ, the resurrected Christ brought the body of his resurrected Christ as a man, we see restored humanity. That is what God the Father sent Jesus to do, to restore humanity to how it should be. And one day we will see it fully at the resurrection. And by the action of the Holy Spirit in our life, we are becoming men and women as God intended. And at the resurrection, we will experience that, that reality because you know, we'll see Jesus as he is. And we'll be like him, the Apostle John says. We'll be completely, fully human. And again, as I said before, we have been completely liberated from the power of sin, the power of God to live united to the gift of righteousness. Who is the gift of righteousness? Jesus Christ. He's defeated sin. He lives in us. So we listen to him. We are not under the power of sin anymore. And as I said before, although evil seems to be winning at this point, it's just an illusion. I shouldn't say an illusion. It's a reality. But it has been defeated at its core. It has no future. It's, it's really... It will, it's completely undone, and we'll see it one day. So we are going to look at the example of a few people who accept this reality of their new life in Christ. And these people and faithful Christians, faithful believers, cannot be manipulated by government, by oppressors, by dictators, or by any of this world system because... Just as people we're going to talk about in a few minutes, they belong to a different order. They belong to the kingdom of God just like we do. They know that the threat of losing their life is not the end. They have the hope of the resurrection, which they hold on to in their resolve, belief, trust, and faith in Jesus. And they're the same and that as the heroes of faith that we read about in Hebrews 11 a few weeks ago. And this is the hope that we all have as we live in this world. Jesus was the light of the world when he came to the earth. He was rejected. And because we belong to Jesus, because we live in him, the good news is that we are light in this world. This is our new reality. This is the new creation that God has made. And we read about that in Ephesians 5, 8, where he says, for at one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Why can, how can we walk as children of light? Because Jesus has liberated us from the slavery of sin. We will die physically. Our physical flesh will not make it to immortality. But God will change us so that we will one day. And right now, we are to walk as children of light. Why? Because God lives in us. And in God's purpose for humanity, we are to be his witnesses in this world, wherever we live. And Jesus does not define success by the same standard as the world. What is important is that we stay faithful, inspired by our brothers and sisters, as one example of the church in Smyrna, whatever our situation may be, we are to be witnesses of Jesus wherever we are planted, whether in Canada or other countries in the world. We are the temple of the living God who shines his life to a dying world through us. And all this glory is the glory of God. It is God's work of salvation. We cannot save anyone, but we can be witness to Jesus Christ. 
So let's go back and learn some things about the Church of Smyrna. And it will help us to understand who they were and how they can be an example to each and every one of us. And then we'll consider a few examples in our contemporary world of brothers and sisters in the faith who live in extraordinary circumstances. So Smyrna is the ancient name for the city of Izmir in Turkey. And this is some of the ruins of that city. And this is how the city looks like at night. It's a beautiful city, a huge city. And in the ancient world, Smyrna was the, lovely, lovely, the loveliest city of the seven churches. It was called the crown, the crown of Asia and the flower of Asia. It was the birthplace of many famous people such as Homer. It was also the home of Bishop Polycarp, a Christian who was martyred. It is the only city of the seven churches which has survived. The name has been changed to Izmir. And Izmir is the third largest city in the modern, in the modern country of, of Turkey. And I was reading in Leo System Travel. It says a large number of prehistoric settlements have been discovered by archaeologists in what is now Izmir. For nearly 10,000 years, there have been humans inhabiting the surrounding areas of what is now a big city. The main reason for this is that the land that Izmir is located on is very mountainous. So it offers great protection from any attacks or unwanted visitors. Furthermore, it was located in what is now known as the Gulf of Izmir, which further adds to the strategic importance of the city. And like all the cities at the end of the first century, idolatry was rampant in Smyrna. Not only did they indulge in the Greek gods, such as Dionysius, the god of wine, but they also serve the, the, but also the citizens of Smyrna were at the forefront of the Roman emperor worship. The first temple of the Aroma, dedicated to the worship of the goddess of Rome, was, was constructed at Smyrna. There was also a temple to honor the emperor Tiber Tiberius. And the emphasis on worshiping the Roman emperor was as savior and lord led to the intensified persecution of the Christians who worship Jesus Christ alone as Savior and Lord. And being a Christian in Smyrna at, that, at the end of the first century was not easy. In fact, it was risky, as James Fowler writes. So it was a very pagan city, and emperor worship was rampant, and everybody had to plead allegiance to the emperor. And when Christians said, no, we don't, Plead our, our, our allegiance is not to the emperor, but our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And when they, they, they refuse to bow, bow down before the emperor, of course, they stood out and they were persecuted. But it's interesting that Jesus very clearly tells them that he knows their affliction and the crushing pressure that they were living under. The Christians in Smyrna were very faithful to Jesus Christ. Jesus told the church in, in, in Smyrna, Jesus told the church in Ephesus that they had lost their first love. Smyrna did not. He commended them because unlike the brethren in the churches in, of Pergamum and Thyatira, they had not become indifferent to or become compromising around them. So they were faithful to Jesus Christ. They were not compromising. They were not indifferent. They did not grow cold. They did, they did not become lukewarm like the church in Laodicea. And the church was, not unlike, was unlike the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis appeared to be living, but in fact, it was dead. It had good appearances on the, on the outside. But inside it was dead. But it was not so for the, the church in Smyrna. And Jesus told them that they were under pressure and 
for some of them, the pressure would increase. Some of them would be thrown in prison because of their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And the devil was going to turn against them. And Jesus told them to be faithful unto death and that he would give them the crown of life. And as we look to the church in Smyrna, it's far from the religious teachings of the health and wealth gospel, isn't it? You know, the health and wealth gospel says that if we are a Christian, that we are to be outwardly successful, that we are to be physically prosperous, and all those things, that we are to be healthy all the time. And that we, and Smyrna was not successful according to the world's point of view. And in, in their persecution and in, in, in their poverty, what does Jesus tell them? Jesus tells them that they, were, that they were rich, not materially, but spiritually rich. And, and, and being rich, certainly, in Christ is not the equivalent of being rich in the material blessings. And Jesus said that very clearly when he came to the earth, didn't he? He said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of, of his possession. So these people in Smyrna were people just like you and I. They had families. They had relatives. They had friends. But in that city, they were different. Because their allegiance was to Jesus Christ. And when we look at the church in Smyrna, we get a good picture of what it looks like to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And, you know, we are to be a faithful to Jesus Christ, whether we live in a city like Smyrna or whether we live in Canada where we are not persecuted like they were. We're not asked to bow down to, to any physical man. We still have the liberty to, to worship, which is a wonderful gift. But like this, whatever, whatever our situation, like the brethren in Smyrna, we need, to, we need to live our lives with perseverance, with tenacity, with, with, with tenacity and love for God and neighbor. And right now, I'd just like to show you a, just a brief video from the International Day of Prayer. It's a short video. It's just about three minutes. And... Uh, it gives us an appreciation of what some of our brothers and sisters in the world are going, are experiencing. Millions of Christians across the world are persecuted because of their faith. Persecution can take many different forms, oppression, imprisonment, martyrdom, and displacement. Displacement brings with it homelessness, hunger, insecurity and uncertainty. In Afghanistan, the recent Taliban takeover has created a refugee crisis. Under the new authoritarian regime, Christians who were already vulnerable face increased persecution. They can be charged with apostasy, which is punishable by death or imprisonment. Flight might be the only option for many of those whose lives are at risk. In North and Central Nigeria, Boko Haram and Fulani militants continue to attack Christian villages. Thousands have been killed and tens of thousands have been forced to flee. Many have lost everything and are living in temporary camps where they continue to suffer from the trauma of their experiences. In Ethiopia, Eritrean Christians have been displaced for a second time. Originally forced to leave their authoritarian homeland, now their refugee camps in Ethiopia have been attacked. Many have fled to cities further south where they are destitute and treated with suspicion by the locals. In Iraq, Christians continue to face uncertainty. Only 300,000 Christians remain in the country. Some of them have been displaced several times over. Despite the defeat of ISIS, they want to leave Iraq for fear that they'll be targeted again in the future. 
Christians are being forced to flee from several other countries across the world, including Syria, Somalia, Pakistan, North Korea, and Iran. On this International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, we remember our brothers and sisters who have been displaced. We stand with them and we pray with them. We thank God that they have a citizenship in heaven that can never be taken away. And in their temporary exile, we reach out to help them. Through our network of international partners, Release International is helping to provide food, accommodation, trauma counselling and pastoral care to displaced Christians across the world. I'd like to show you some of the countries that they were talking about here and uh, just to highlight a few. Uh, in Syria, for example, an estimated 700,000 Christians have fled following years of civil war and persecution. And many now live in refugee camps in neighboring states. In Iran, uh, authorities harass and imprison the leaders of underground churches, forcing a number of, to seek refugees in neighboring Turkey. So, and the list goes on of similar situation in these various countries. And uh, so, and we can look at the lives of, of some of these people, uh, just a few, what they live. Although many Christians managed to leave Afghanistan ahead of the Taliban advance, there are still thought to be several thousands in the country, many Christians who remain, who, who remain are trapped, unable to leave through seals, through sealed borders. Some have received death threats, others have fled to remote areas to escape in Taliban, to escape the Taliban, sorry. Release international partners continue to provide critical support through broadcast media. And this is a vital lifeline in hard to reach location. It will now be much more difficult and dangerous for believers and seekers in Afghanistan to accept to access biblical materials. So radio ministry is a, is a key tool. And I included some of these in the bulletin, so you'll be able to read that. Um, more than 150 people were killed when Boko Haram attacked Daniel's village, including his three sons and his father. His wife was also abducted and forcibly married to a Muslim. Daniel managed to escape and flee to uh, Maiduguri, the state capital where he, is, where he now lives in a camp for internationally displaced people. And by the grace of God, and despite all he has been through, Daniel remains firm in his faith. I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, he said. And also, I'll just go over this one. You'll be able to look at that. If you listen to the sermon, it will be uh, tried to put the PDF copy as well so that you'll be able to read that. And uh, last, um, Morteza and Arizu ran a house church in Iran for their lives, but their lives changed forever the day they were summoned by Iran State Intelligence Agency for questioning. Uh, Mortiza was subsequently threatened and eventually his business was closed down. Finally, the couple felt they had no option but to flee. They left everything behind and made their way to Turkey. By the grace of God, they became involved in Christian ministry in Turkey and have seen more than 300 people baptized. So we see that although these people are poor, they are rich in Christ and God is continuing to work through them. And we have several points of prayer. And again, these are on the bulletin on our website. So I, I will not read through all of them. You can read through them 
uh, on our bulletin and include them in your in your prayers uh, this week, coming week, and all the time, I guess, because we need to pray. We need to hold together. There are brothers and sisters, and all, even if we do not see them, and even if they are far away, in Christ we're all united. And uh, so we'll have a closing hymn because uh, 